Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RIA Edge podcast, where we talk to leaders of registered investment advisory firms that are, in our estimation, growing by design and not by default. In this episode, I had the chance to speak with Dan Cedar, who is the managing partner of Blue Chip Partners, a very interesting RIA based in Detroit, Michigan, with some very unique and, I think, thoughtful approaches to how they're building their firm, how they manage their human capital, and where they see their next phase of growth coming from. This conversation took place at Schwab's recent Impact Conference, so apologies for any background noise, but I enjoyed the conversation, and I think you'll find it useful. Thanks for listening. You know, we're here at the Schwab Impact Conference uh, with Dan Cedar, Blue Chip Partners. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, David. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, you know, we're here at the Schwab Impact Conference, and the theme of this conference, obviously, is growth, advisor growth. A lot of people here to facilitate that growth. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a trade show. It's a, it's a, you know, huge, dynamic meeting of a lot of like-minded people, which is interesting. But before we get into any of this stuff, could you just maybe tell me a little bit about Blue Chip Partners? Sure. Uh, you know, where you came from, uh, where you sit, and what your value prop is. Yeah, so we're a traditional wealth management firm. Um, we have 28 employees. I'm a partner with Robert Steinberg. Um, we brought in two other equity partners in 2022, but Robert and I have been together for 18 years and have built a tremendous team. So we focus on financial planning and asset management. So the traditional wealth management shop, we're exploring opportunities to bring in tax and estate planning. The idea is to eventually be a one-stop shop for our clients. So our clients can come in and actually have all services provided under one umbrella. Okay, you're, you're based in Detroit. That's right. Assets under management? That's about... Yeah, we're just shy of a billion two. Okay. And that's probably 600 core households, I okay. would say. So our average client coming in today, walking in the door, is roughly between two and ten million. You know, like any other shop, we have clients that might have less, some clients that might have more. But that bell curve okay. kind of sits in that two to ten million. Uh, yeah. So space. It's, you, if you looked at your pace of growth uh, since the founding, was there? I mean, a lot of uh, firms begin with kind of just go, I uh, take in any client they can. Did you have a strategy to growth? Did you think about you know what the trajectory was going to be like? And yeah, it's um, so Robert. Uh, when I joined Robert yeah. back in 2005, he had just shy of 100 million in assets under management, yeah. Yeah. and I came from an insurance operation that was very sales driven, and so um, sales was kind of how I cut my teeth in the business. And when Robert was interested in hiring somebody, and we ended up crossing paths. He thought I was going to be more of a junior advisor, but we figured out quickly that my skill set, what I brought to the table, was developing relationships and bringing in some business. And so he provided a platform and gave me the autonomy to do that. And um, that was really important because I think in a lot of partnerships, the, the idea of equity and ownership can be very, very challenging to figure out. And one benefit that Robert and I had is I, I was able to grow through some of those growing pains and the idea of equity ownership in an, op, in an operation of cars. The, the more I grew my respective quote unquote book, client base, the more equity he granted me. And it eventually at one point, I think it was in 2016, the client base that I was representing was roughly 40%, 41% of the firm revenue. And so what I did was I bought the other 9% of the shares. We became 50-50 partners. And we made a decision. We said, okay, let's you know really put our heads together. You're, you're bringing something different than I'm bringing. At certain times, I'm in the passenger seat. He's the driver. Sometimes he's in the driver's seat. I'm the passenger. But we said, what can we do to, to really grow an operation? Let's reinvest our dollars back into the business and I think that's really unique because a lot of owner operators tend to run a lean operation and cash flow the business, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the more resources or staff that you have uh, or technology that you have, those are dollars that are coming directly out of the owner's pocket. 
But we said, okay, well, instead of cash flowing the business and going and investing in Apple or Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson, let's reinvest in people and in blue chip, something that we can control. So in 2015, I think we were just north of $300 million in assets under management. In, you know, like I said today, we're just shy of a billion too. But the real jump, not from an AUM perspective, but from an employee perspective, occurred in 2021. So we, we went from 14 employees to 26 employees in about 18 months. Wow. And so what was really challenging about that, or I guess as that growth in employee count started to unfold, we, we could see there were some loosenings of the business that were kind of getting away from us, right? We, we, we were, um, I don't know, I hate to say sloppy, but things just started getting a little loose. Mm -hmm. And that was when we were introduced to EOS. I don't know if you're familiar with the entrepreneurial operating system, which is a business chassis. So it works for, it's industry agnostic. You could be a manufacturing company or a financial services firm or, or a law firm. But we have a business coach and there is a platform for businesses to stay structured, on pace, in line with your goals and objectives, getting, at the end of the day, all of the people on your team rowing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so EOS was instrumental to our growth. And part of the process early on when we uh, met our business coach was we had to come up with core values. So what are the core values of the firm? And one of our six core values is we focus on growth. And so growth from its core is uh, really a, a, a huge focus for us. And um, and within this EOS structure, with, without talking too much about EOS, is there are segments within our business. We have client service, we have financial advisory, we have a number of different operation segments and so I run um, a segment meeting every other week that is focused just on sales and, and growth and developing the business. And why was growth considered a primary value? What, what was the meaning behind that, the purpose behind that? Yeah, yeah. So Why is growth so important? Yeah, growth is important because what it a lot, it, it, it's been hugely rewarding to create jobs. Okay, so as we've created jobs for our, our employees um, and opportunities for our employees, it's really rewarding to see the, the, them develop and the trajectory of their career. But if we're not growing, the opportunity set, once we hire someone, plateaus. Okay, so if, if we're just going to um, maintain the business that we have, the opportunity for our employees is stacked. And so what we're trying to do is develop opportunities, obviously grow wealth for our clients. That's very, very important. But we want to develop opportunities for our employees. They're fantastic. They work really hard on behalf of our clients. And without our employees, we're, we're nothing. So, so it's really creating opportunities for them. And, um, and, and, and growth also, I think, gives or provides for additional resources that can be reinvested back into the client experience. So at the end of the day, you know, it's a, a better offering for our clients, better technology, more advisors. So when I say more advisors, uh, our clients of Blue Chip don't just have one financial advisor. They get a team of financial advisors. So there's often multiple sets of eyes and ears that are attached to the client relationship. And so without the resources, uh, you know, call it the revenue and resources to support uh, additional reinvestments into the firm, we can't do that. Yep. So it's, it's hugely important. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, kudos to you for recognizing that early on that the uh, structure began to kind of wobble a little bit because of the yeah. you know accelerated growth in a pretty short period of time. Yeah. For a small business, that's bringing on a lot of people in a short period of time. So you recognize that things could get a little bit wobbly without a structure there in place to accommodate that. So that's great. Uh, the, you know, when you uh, talk about uh, organic growth, uh, you know, making the better client experience and sure that, you know, feeds on itself, referrals and that sort of thing. Acquisitions have you done at all? Or is that something that you play around here? Are you looking to acquire or bring on board with more? Yeah. So, um, so we've gone back and forth with regards to inorganic growth. Organic growth has always been a, a focus mm -hmm. and is obviously very important. Um, and it's, it's a creative right away. And from a business owner's perspective, you know, we're not, we're not buying the business. Yeah. Um, people are coming to us. But, um, you know, we've, we've acquired, we've had a few tuck-ins over the last three years. We, we 
brought in a $25 million book of just 20, 20 households that um, the advisor who was a retiring CPA didn't have full wallet share of his client relationship. So he was kind of managing an investment practice on the side, but it wasn't his primary primary business. Tax was his primary business. So when he was looking to step back and retire, we acquired that asset and grew it to probably grew it by 3x within 12 months. You know, it was one of those acquiring additional wallet share was uh, was really powerful. Um, we brought in an advisor who had been in the, you know, the business, the professional services businesses for uh, 30 years. He was from LPL. Mm-hmm. So we, we tucked in about $90 million in assets under management um, in 2021 with him. Okay. Um, we've had an advisor that brought some business over um, as she she you know left her, her prior firm and came to ours. So we have grown the book inorganically. We thought that was going to be a focus for ours uh, moving forward, and it dawned upon us maybe six months ago. I mean, this is relatively new. That you know, when when we're acquiring business, it's it's difficult. It takes a long time, right? You're kind of doing the song and dance with the other owner operator. You know, you want to make sure it's a cultural fit. There are legal fees. All of a sudden, the clients that are you know transitioning over are. And it's sitting in, at your table with their arms crossed, mm-hmm. you know, you're reselling your value pro- proposition, mm-hmm. and and our current advisors, as we're purchasing practices or thinking about purchasing practices, are looking at it and saying, "Wow, that's just more work for us. That's more, uh, you know, clients to manage. You know, um, it's hard to get excited about that mm-hmm. when it feels like it's just adding more to their already busy plates." Mm-hmm. And so. So what we said about six months ago, we said, okay, how about this? And I, I started with this in the beginning, but can we offer additional services under one umbrella to elevate the client experience? And then that gives an arrow, an, you know, another arrow in the quiver for our advisors to go out and be excited to talk about additional opportunities. So I talked about tax. Tax is one segment. Our goal is to do 1040 work for our clients, not to build a tax firm. It's really hard referring tax work out, uh, particularly 1040 tax work, out to CPAs. CPAs are interested in uh, audit, doing uh, small businesses. They're very disinterested in doing another 1040. And so so we want to handle 1040 work for our clients in-house. We're also looking to fill a seat for estate planning. We're actively interviewing for that now. So we do have blue chip estate planning as a separate entity as well. To, to make it this one-stop shop that our advisors can be excited not only to talk uh, to prospects about, but our existing clients and, and additional services for our clients. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so when you uh, add the 1040 tax work sleep, would that be a, a hire or a, a, a another acquisition of a firm? Would that a hire. A hire. Yeah, so, so, so we, we're, to... we're kind of in the bottom of the ninth inning right now with an individual that we think is, is going to be a great fit. We haven't signed at the bottom line, okay. but, but we're right there. Okay. So, yeah, we think we have that in process. The estate planning is is next, the next focus. But that, um, I think that's that's it's a really powerful message. And for 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 growing from this point moving forward, I don't know if there's a lot of other firms in our local market our, at our size that can say they're offering those services all under one umbrella. Right, right, in, in the Detroit area, yeah. in Michigan. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Most of your clients in Michigan, or you can extend yeah, a little bit Yeah, for the most part, I mean, yeah. I would say that they stem from Michigan. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, uh, we've, like any advisor here at Impact, you know, you would you'd go around and say, hey, how are you growing your business? And, you know, 95% of people would say, most of my new business comes from referrals, yep. you know. And sure. so everybody's getting <laughs> referrals because they have long-standing client relationships. Mm-hmm. And, and we do, too. So that's that's happening we're encouraging and training our advisors to source names. And and when I say source names, if I'm in a conversation with a client and they bring up, you know, their colleague from work or their friend that they went on a golf trip with, we're training our advisors to listen, to write those names down and not in the meeting there that day, but two weeks later, circle back with the client and say, hey, you brought up Jim, you know, your colleague Jim. And the question is, is Jim approachable? Mm-hmm. You know, Jim sounds like a kind of guy that, that would fit up here at Blue Chip. I'm just curious from your perspective, is Jim approachable? And what we found is the response is either, geez, I don't know. 
I, 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 I don't think Jim's approachable or Jim absolutely is approachable. Let me introduce you mm-hmm. or hey, your other client, Bob knows Jim better than me. Ask Bob, but I'm sure Bob can do an intro yeah. and connect you guys. And so, so it's been a great way to not sit back and wait for the phone to ring, but to proactively press people for introductions, not necessarily referrals. I don't like calling them referrals, but right. introductions to their mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. And then we take it from there. That's, that's been, um, yeah, it, it's interesting, you know, the, um, the, the RA side of the financial services business has always been, you know, fiduciaries on the side of the clients and in some respects they, 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 they maybe a lot of firms shy away from sort of the sales tactics that you're talking about. Right. And, and, you know, you're not selling something you don't believe in. You're right. obviously you're selling something you believe, in, but, uh, to use that kind of, which I kind of hear coming from your insurance background, maybe like, you yeah. know, that this is how you. This is how you work the business. Uh, yeah. This is how you get new business. So you're bringing some of that to the RAA space. And I think a lot of advisors are not great at that. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. Yeah. I'd agree. And it's, um, and, and again, having the additional quiver of te- like something like tax or estate planning, it's really easy on the golf course to ask somebody, hey, who does your tax return? Mm-hmm. For some reason, it's really awkward and uncomfortable to say, hey, who's your financial advisor? Yeah. It's personal. It's, it's like, wait a second, you, now you're asking too much about, you know, is it, right. are you asking about my wealth? Uh, that's not the, none yeah. of your business. Right. You know, so, right. so um, do you work, you know, do you do your tax work at H&R Block or do you use a local CPA? Do you like them? You know, it's just a really easy conversation. Yeah. And, um, but you asked about the local market in Michigan. What, what we've done recently is spent some money on marketing. And so... Impact Communications has been fantastic. I mean, they've really helped us in the PR sense in getting our brand out there from original content on our blog. We run a podcast on a weekly basis. Our, our director of investments, Daniel Dusina, does, he calls it the Quarterly Edge. It's a quarterly newsletter with you know, market commentary and insights. And so we're, we're responding to media inquiries. We're getting published. So Impact has really helped our brand awareness and as part of that venture, I, I, I think this is uh, very powerful, and I'm waiting to see where it goes. With the change in the marketing world, we took the leap of faith to go out there and ask our clients to give us Google reviews okay. online. And so the, the tough part about that is if somebody gives you a review and they write something negative, you're not allowed to respond. So we had the confidence because of our, our clients and how we serve them and what we bring to the table we had the confidence to ask clients to submit testimonial Google reviews online. Mm-hmm. And so in our local market, I think we have 164 Google reviews. And so if you Google financial advisor near me, blue chip rises to the top. And just like any other item a consumer might purchase on Amazon, you're looking at the star ratings. Sure. How many people have rated this business or these services? And you can actually go in and see what our clients are saying about about our advisors and the services our advisors are offering, and it's really compelling. It's powerful. That is fantastic. And the, the these rules were just in, put in place. Yeah, these are right. testimonial rules. Right? So right. uh, and I, don't, I still think a lot of advisors have not embraced it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's scary because you know, frankly, if somebody goes on and writes a rogue review, that's there. Yeah. I mean, it's got to stay there, and we yeah. can't respond to it. So, so. Thankfully, that hasn't been the case yet, yeah. um, you know, and we hope it's, it's not. But because of that, so when we were talking about referrals and introductions and sourcing names, we, um, we're starting to spend some money on Google My Business and, you know, all these different um, internet marketing engines. And because of that, we're now getting roughly, and it, it, you know, this won't sound like it's earth shattering, but we're getting about one inbound lead cold call a day where prospects are calling us saying, hey, I found you online. I'd like to set up a meeting and connect. That's fantastic. So, um, and they're not all qualified. They don't all fit the profile of what sure. we're looking for as a firm, you know, in clients, because it has to be a mutual fit, right? Sure. It's, it's, it's got to be a fit for the prospect. It has to be a fit for us. So there, there, there is, you know, some sifting that we have to do to, to try sure. to qualify these leads. But our vision is once we can develop this one-stop shop mentality and, and offering, is to really take that to uh, you know to the marketing world and uh, ramp up our marketing. Interesting. That's a, a 
use of technology. I mean, you're, you're a young firm. I imagine technology is kind of a native place for you to live, and yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, your uh, uh, ideal client, I think the, the client profile is largely executives, uh, yeah, corporate we, executives. Yep, that's right. It, it would be uh, one niche area that we work with. We work with um, corporate executives that get paid with company stock. And so a lot of individuals in the corporate world have equity-based compensation. So that's a fancy way of saying they get stock options or restricted stock or uh, performance shares. And as you know, over time that accumulates, it's really easy to be granted an award, but it's really difficult to make a decision to sell that award. And so they tend to let them accumulate. And it's not uncommon to see an executive who might have 70 or 80% of their net worth tied up in company stock. And so so we help them um, run an analysis, um, you know, not only on the company and the, the technical factors for reducing their, their, their exposure to the stock, but we're helping them with tax reports and understanding the, the tax liability and the financial planning of how the proceeds or that concentrated stock position fit into their long-term financial plan. So. It's um it's one niche market, but yeah, you know, it's, I would say uh, it's been a, a pretty big focus of ours over the years. Uh, another unique thing about your firm is that you uh, value investment management, uh, bespoke investment management, and that's kind of a contrary tre- contrary trend to a lot of what firms are doing, which are being told, you know, don't touch the investment management, yeah. you know, be the advisor, don't worry about the investments, yeah. put that in a basket of ETFs or index or whatever. Yeah, uh, you're doing something different. Yeah, that's right. So um, a lot of advisors um, feel like their their value add is in financial planning, and they outsource the money management to product managers. That could be uh, mutual funds, ETFs, SMAs, you know, structured products, annuities, whatever you know, mm-hmm. products that that are are purchased by the consumer. And so we felt it was important to, um, and again, when you talk about a growing firm to have an independent investment department. Daniel Ducina is our director of investments. So CFA spent six years at BlackRock in New York and is uh, just a tremendous asset in, in that he runs not only the investment department, he's the chair of the investment committee that meets on a weekly basis with some other advisors and members of our firm. So, um, yeah, it is a, it is a customized uh, bespoke solution that is predicated on individual stocks. So our equity model is individual companies that have a history of not only paying, but growing a dividend. Mm-hmm. So diverse five portfolio businesses. And then we manage uh, on the fixed income side, a low cost ETF and mutual fund mix. Okay. So so we do outsource on, on the fixed income side, but we, we take the in-house management of the equity component on our, ourselves. Okay, that's fantastic. And I imagine a lot of the clients that you come to you with these concentrated stock positions, that's one way that you can transition those out in a portfolio. It's easier to do that than if you're putting it into an ETF or, you know. That's right. ETF. Yeah. And, 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 um, and it was an amazing story. I mean, uh, you know, we, Robert had an experience. Um, this was in the midst of the financial crisis. So it was 2000, I think it was 2008. Yeah. And a client came in, he was actually waiting in the parking lot. Uh, one morning when Robert drove into the office at about 7.30. And so that can get a little dicey, right? You're, you're wondering, right? yeah. in the midst of the financial crisis, there's a car in the parking lot. Is this a disgruntled client? Where you know, Where's this going? Yeah. This gentleman wanted to sell his entire portfolio and go to, go to cash. He was nervous. And so Robert sat down with them, and they went position by position through the portfolio. And at that time, we were managing mutual funds and ETFs, just like most other traditional advisors. And so Robert's going through each position, mutual fund, ETF, would you like to sell this? Here's the tax impact. Yes, yes, yes. And this this gentleman had a concentrated position in Comerica. Okay. And Robert said, well, surely you want to sell the Comerica stock. Uh, we're, it's, right now it's a, a global financial crisis. And the guy reaches into his pocket, pulls out an ATM slip and says... I just got back from the ATM at Comerica. They're going to be fine. Let's keep that position. <laughs> so it was eye-opening to us. We said, wait a second. Investors don't understand this mutual fund or ETF that has a fancy name. But when they buy shares of McDonald's and they're driving down the street, they see the line from the drive through that's out you know, into yeah. the parking lot. Yeah. They can understand that business. And so our clients get the transparency of knowing what they own and when times get tough 
it helps them weather the storm in a way that a product just um, it just it doesn't work in the black box world of Wall Street. Interesting. Oh, huh? interesting. Well, that's great. It's, it's obviously working for you because you are experiencing this organic growth. Uh, and you know, is, is there if you had looked across your business and identified constraints to growth? Where do, you, where do you think is, what's holding you back and what, what, what kind of, are you thinking about focusing on, on next? Yeah, I mean, so it's not necessarily holding us back, but um, hiring is always a challenge. Talent. You know, you, you have to be one step ahead of the curve. And so while we don't have a financial advisory position open right now, we're still doing interviews. People that we get introduced to or that reach out um, and, and inquire, and if they're a good fit, we'll take them through our hiring process, which is which is really unique. Um, you know, hiring the right talent is always, the, you know, the toughest thing. And if you if you build it, they will come. So we're, we're trying to build out an organization of just top-notch professionals that have great credentials and that are hungry. You know, that's another saying that um, I think Robert got from Grant Hill. He said, you can't teach hunger. And, you know, we look to hire people that are hungry and want to go out and really make a big impact. So for, not only for their own career, but for their clients. So I would say hiring um, another constraint, which is interesting, we, we, uh, we're in the process of solving it, is space. So office space. So okay. as, as we you know build out this team, we had 7,200 square feet, which was half of the first floor of, of the building we're in. And for about the last, uh, I don't know, I'd say the last couple of years, we've had certain members from our client service team rotating from home so working from home because we didn't have enough didn't have space. space yeah it's a small space for 20 some people that's right yeah. yeah so um so we just took on the other half so the other half of the first floor so we have the full first floor in our building now which is about eight uh that was another eight thousand square feet so we'll we'll have just over fifteen thousand square feet and so office space you know is is tough because you know you're you're adding people but people need seats for, for yeah. you know, yeah. seats to sit. Yeah. Well, you might be one of the only commercial real estate uh, renter yeah, out in the market buying it. Probably find some deals now in uh, yeah. real estate. Yeah. Sure yeah and, a, and also work from home. You know, there a lot of firms are working from home and, and it is so important for us. I mean, we really attribute the, the success of our firm to, the, to our great team and having a culture that people are excited to show up to work every day. So we do... Um, happy hours and lunches and community uh, service. We, we give back to the community. So a lot of the things that we're trying to do can't be done virtually. So if the team is working from home, the, it's, it's, it's just hard to build the culture the, the right way. So we really want to have butts in the seats, you know, most of the time, you know, in the office most of the time, recognizing that there's some flexibility for, for work from home post-COVID. Um, but all of that kind of, kind of, you know, loops into, we were awarded um, from Crane's Detroit business um, in the best places to work. We were number 29 this year, which was a real honor. You know, it was an independent survey that was um, given to our employees. We we gave them no feedback or direction on our end. We frankly forgot about it. And yeah. then got an email months later that said, hey, congratulations, you guys are in the top 100. So Robert and I went to the to the award ceremony, and they're ticking down, you know, calling the, the names of these firms from 100 down to one, you know, number one. And we saw some really, really reputable firms in our industry that were called in the, the 60s and 50s and 40s. And when we saw those names, we said, geez, there's no way. Uh, I, I guess hey, it was great that we were considered, but we're not going to be any better than, than these firms. And we, we clicked in at 29 and, and that was uh, a real honor. We felt proud of the team and, and the group that we're building. Well, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that, that is a real honor and a testament to what you're, to what you're doing there. So, yeah. uh, 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 Dan Cedar, this has been great. David, thank much. you. I really appreciate, appreciate you having me on. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RAA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.